Hello and welcome to Zoology 141. Today's lecture will be on the cellular level of organization and also on membrane transport. So in today's lecture we're going to describe the components of cells. We're going to talk about the major functions of the cellular organelles. For example, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, and so on. We're also going to talk about membrane transport processes, that is diffusion and osmosis. And we're going to talk about the structure and function of the cell membrane. And we're also going to list the different ways through which substances pass through the cell membrane. And finally, we're going to wrap up the lecture with a brief discussion of mitosis and cell division. So any animal cell can be divided into three very large parts. And these include the plasma membrane, which encircles the outside of the cell, the cytoplasm, which is everything inside of the cell with the exception of the nucleus, and this includes the cytosol, or the cellular jelly that all the organelles are floating in, as well as the organelles themselves. Examples of organelles include things like the mitochondrion and also the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. And finally, in the center of most cells, we find a nucleus. We're going to talk about the structures and functions of all of these different cellular parts in the upcoming slides. Okay, so let's start out with the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is basically everything inside the cellular membrane. So it includes the cytosol, which is the cellular jelly in which the organelles are floating, as well as the organelles themselves. Now, some textbooks technically say that the nucleus is not part of the cytoplasm, but don't worry, I'm not going to try to trick you on an exam. As far as you're concerned, anything that's inside the cell membrane is part of the cytoplasm. Now, of course, one of the most conspicuous organelles inside the cell is the nucleus. The nucleus is basically the control center of the cell. It contains all of the DNA, or most of the DNA, inside the cell. And remember, the DNA is a genetic blueprint. It allows the cells to reproduce, and it also allows them to manufacture proteins and other substances which are needed in the cell. Now, the nucleus itself is divided into two different regions. There is a nuclear membrane, which basically regulates passage of substances from the cytosol into and out of the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, we find something called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is a dark staining region where we synthesize things called ribosomes. And we'll talk about what ribosomes are in the upcoming slides. Now, of course, one thing that we find inside the nucleus is the DNA. Remember, the DNA is the genetic blueprint to manufacture new cells, but it also contains the instructions or recipes to make proteins and other substances that are going to be needed by the cells. So this DNA can be divided into different chromosomes. Now, a chromosome is basically a DNA molecule wrapped around a protein called a histone. And normally, these chromosomes are not visible except during the time of cellular division. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the lecture. So suffice it to say, we have several DNA molecules in each nucleus. In fact, each human somatic cell, and here somatic means body, has 46 chromosomes arranged in 23 pairs. And we'll talk about what the pairs of chromosomes mean here in a minute. But to recap, a chromosome is simply just DNA wound around a protein, and these chromosomes, of course, are found within the nucleus. Now, one of the first organelles we're going to find outside the nucleus is something called a ribosome. Remember, the ribosomes were actually manufactured inside the nucleolus of the nucleus. And the ribosomes themselves are composed of something called ribosomal RNA, as well as some protein. Now remember, RNA is another type of nucleic acid, and it stands for ribonucleic acid. Unlike DNA, RNA molecules are single-stranded, whereas DNA molecules are double-stranded. So there's two different types of ribosomes that can be found in the cell. Some ribosomes are classified as free ribosomes because they are found loose in the cytosol, that is, floating around in the cellular jelly. And these ribosomes are destined to synthesize proteins that are going to be used inside the cell. On the other hand, some other ribosomes are found attached to membranes of other organelles. And these are called bound or membrane-bound ribosomes. So they're attached to organelles such as the endoplasmic reticulum, or some may be attached to the nuclear membrane. So these also synthesize proteins. However, they synthesize proteins that are going to be needed for the plasma membrane, or more importantly, for export out of the cell. Now, there's also ribosomes that are associated with the mitochondria. And as you might expect, these ribosomes synthesize proteins which are exclusively needed by the mitochondria. So the big picture here is that ribosomes synthesize protein. And we find ribosomes in two places. One, free ribosomes, 
floating out in the cytosol, and these are going to make proteins for use inside the cell, whereas membrane-bound ribosomes are attached to organelles, and they're going to make proteins for use either in the cell membrane or for export outside of the cell. So we said before that the nucleus was the command center of the cell. And of course the nucleus contains the DNA molecules, which are important for cell replication, but also for directing the cell's activities. And one of the most important activities that the cell does is to manufacture protein. In fact, most of its day is spent synthesizing protein, either for use in the cell or out of the cell. And the proteins that are made by the cell will determine both the physical and chemical characteristics of the cells. Now the instructions to make these proteins, of course, are going to be found on our DNA molecule, which is located inside the nucleus. And the process of making proteins can be divided into two very large steps. The first of these is called transcription, and the second one is called translation. Now if you've already read your textbook, you know that it goes into very fine detail on the process of transcription and translation. And this is an area where I'm going to pull back and not hold you responsible for everything that is in the textbook. So please do read the chapter and please do read the section on transcription and translation, but know when it comes to an exam, I'm primarily going to ask you things that are found in the lecture. So first, let's start out with the process called transcription. Transcription, as defined by your textbook, is a process where genetic information encoded in the DNA molecule is copied down into a single-stranded RNA molecule called mRNA, or messenger RNA. And this is going to be the instruction set that the ribosomes use to translate or synthesize the protein. Now to think of it in another way, I want you to think of the DNA molecules inside your cell as being a very ginormous cookbook. And this cookbook contains lots and lots of recipes. But in this case, we don't want to make all the recipes at once, we just want to make a single recipe. And in this case, the recipe is going to be for a protein. So imagine going to your grandmother's cookbook and you find a recipe that you want to make you're going to copy that recipe down onto a piece of paper, and this is analogous to transcription. We go to the cookbook, we find a single recipe, and we copy it down. But instead of copying that recipe down onto paper, we're copying it down into the mRNA, or messenger RNA molecule. Now once that copy's been made, the messenger RNA molecule can leave the nucleus and enter the cytosol, where we begin the next step. The second step is called translation. As defined by your textbook, this is the process where we read the mRNA transcript and we begin to assemble the polypeptide or protein using the various amino acids. Now remember, the ribosome is the organelle responsible for translating this mRNA transcript into an actual protein or polypeptide. So again, we're going to talk about analogy. We already said that the mRNA transcript was like a single recipe copied down out of a very giant cookbook. If we follow that analogy, the ribosome would be the cook or the chef. The ribosome's job is to read that mRNA transcript and assemble the amino acids in the correct order in order to make the proper protein. And that's exactly what happens during translation. Basically, the ribosome reads through the mRNA transcript, which we said was like a recipe, and based on the instructions in that recipe, it will assemble the amino acids in the correct order in order to generate a polypeptide. Now, it's important to realize that proteins can be very, very large molecules, and so we often have more than one ribosome working on translating this protein at one time. And oftentimes, we call this a polyribosome complex. And it's basically like having several different chefs in the kitchen working on one very large meal. So the chefs are reading the information from the recipe, that is the mRNA, and they're translating that information into the actual protein by assembling the amino acids in the correct sequence. So to recap, remember that protein synthesis involves two steps, transcription and translation. Transcription is a process that happens inside the nucleus, and that's where we copy down a small segment from the DNA molecule into a single-stranded RNA molecule. And we said that that segment was essentially like a recipe for an individual protein. Now that mRNA transcript will then leave the nucleus and enter the cytosol, where our ribosome will basically read the information from that mRNA molecule and assemble the protein by putting individual amino acids together. So again, translation is the process of taking that recipe and translating it into a functional protein. 
and translation happens outside the nucleus. So that's just a quick and dirty explanation of the processes of transcription and translation. As I said, I'm not going to require you to know all the wealth of information that's covered in the section of translation and transcription in your textbook, but I do want you to read this portion of the chapter so that you'll be more familiar with how the process works. Now we said in the last slide that it's basically the ribosome's job to translate the recipe or mRNA into an actual amino acid sequence that will eventually become a protein. So we said the ribosomes are essentially the chefs or the cooks. Now remember that ribosomes can be located in two different areas of the cell. Some are floating around free in the cytosol, and in that case they're going to make proteins for use inside the cell, and some are membrane bound, that is they are associated with organelles, and in this case they're going to synthesize proteins for use outside of the cell. So some of these ribosomes are associated with something called the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, is a network of membranes that form flattened sacs or tubules called cisterns, and these are confluent or connected to the nucleus. Now there are two different types of endoplasmic reticulum. Rough endoplasmic reticulum, or rough ER, is continuous with the nuclear membrane and has an outer surface that is studded with ribosomes. And these are membrane-bound ribosomes. And what do ribosomes do? That's right, they synthesize proteins. So in this case, the function of the rough ER will be to synthesize proteins for use either in the cell membrane or for export outside of the cell. Smooth ER, on the other hand, is found at the periphery or towards the outside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now, smooth ER does not have any ribosomes, and that's why we say it's smooth. And because it doesn't have ribosomes, we know that it cannot secrete or make proteins. What the smooth ER does do is that it is responsible for making lipids. For example, if you eat a very high carbohydrate diet, but have no fat in your diet, your smooth ER can basically convert those extra sugar molecules into fat that can be stored throughout the body. So one essential role of the smooth ER is to synthesize lipids. Another role of the smooth ER is to detoxify certain types of compounds, and we'll talk about this more as the lecture progresses. So in summary, the rough and smooth ER are really responsible for synthesizing and making molecules. The rough ER synthesizes proteins, whereas the smooth ER synthesizes lipids. The smooth ER is also responsible for detoxifying chemicals and also storing calcium ions that are going to be needed for muscle contraction. We'll talk more about the smooth ER when we get to the section on muscle physiology. So here's a picture of both the rough and smooth ER within the cell. On the left side of the screen, you can see the nucleus, a very large organelle, and connected to that is our rough ER. There's actually pores that allow passage of mRNA from the nucleus into the rough ER. And remember, the rough ER is called rough because it is studded with the ribosomes that are going to be making proteins. Now connected on the outside of the rough ER, we find the smooth ER. Smooth ER does not have any ribosomes, it does not secrete protein, but what it does do is detoxify certain compounds and also synthesize lipids. Now whether we're making proteins or lipids, once that molecule manufacture is complete, that substance will bud off either the rough or smooth ER in something called a vesicle. A vesicle is simply a membrane-bound inclusion that is used to transport things within the cell. Our next organelle is called the Golgi complex, or sometimes the Golgi apparatus. Now the principal function of the Golgi apparatus is to process, sort, and deliver proteins and lipids to the plasma membrane and elsewhere within the cell. I like to think of the Golgi apparatus as basically being the FedEx of the cell. It's responsible for packaging and shipping. So substances that are made by either the rough ER or smooth ER will bud off the surfaces of those organelles and travel to the Golgi complex via vesicles. Now, once they enter the Golgi complex, it will modify these molecules and get them ready for export out of the cell, or they will direct them to other organelles within the cell, for example, maybe the lysosomes. We'll talk more about the Golgi complex in the upcoming slides, but the big thing you need to remember is Golgi complex is the FedEx of the cell responsible for packaging and shipping. So here you can get an overview of how the Golgi complex works. 
at the right side of the screen you can see a vesicle that is budding off the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And remember, if it's coming off the rough ER, it's probably carrying a protein or polypeptide that is eventually destined for use outside of the cell. And so this substance or molecule will bud off of the rough ER in a vesicle, which is a membrane-bound inclusion, and it will travel to the Golgi complex. Then that vesicle will fuse with the Golgi complex, extrude that protein in the inside of the cisterny or sacs of the Golgi complex, and the process of moving across the Golgi complex, the protein will be modified. A lot of times we make proteins that are in an inactive form. For example, we have proteins that will be used to digest protein inside the stomach. Now think about if you're making a protein digesting enzyme inside of your cell, why would you not want that to become active inside your cell? Well, the answer is because it would possibly digest your own cellular proteins and that would be bad. So initially that protein is made by the ER in an inactive form. It travels to the Golgi complex and the Golgi will further modify that protein and get it ready to become activated. Now once that happens, the modified protein will then bud off the distal face of the Golgi and travel to the cell membrane where it will be secreted. That is, the secretory vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane and the contents of that vesicle are extruded outside the plasma membrane into the extracellular fluid. Our next organelle is the lysosome. A lysosome is a membrane-enclosed vesicle that contains powerful digestive enzymes. So basically it's like a cellular stomach, and its purpose is to digest large molecules and break them up so they can be used inside the cell or so they can be gotten rid of. Now the internal pH of the stomach can become quite acidic, a pH of around 5.0, and one of the reasons we have these lysosomes is to, one, get rid of any foreign substances that enter the cell, and two, for the process of autophagy. Autophagy basically means self-digestion. And what happens here is that we sometimes have organelles or parts of the cell that are no longer functioning. And so we can generate new organelles quite easily, but we also have to have a way of getting rid of the old organelles. Otherwise, it would be like you know one of those houses you see that has all the cars stacked up in the front yard and none of them work. And so the function of the lysosome here is to act more as a garbage man. They chop up these old organelles and recycle their components to be used in new organelles. Now, in order to do all this cellular digesting, the lysosomes have to have some pretty powerful hydrolytic enzymes. And of course, this is a good thing if we're just going around and recycling worn out organelles. But what happens when somebody dies, or at least when their cells die, is that these lysosomes can basically leak a lot of these enzymes into the cell. And this leaking of powerful protein digesting enzyme will cause something called autolysis. Autolysis is basically self-digestion. The powerful enzymes within the lysosome leak out and digest the cells. And in part, this is responsible for the relatively rapid decay that happens to humans and other animals after they die. So this slide shows a schematic of how lysosomes are used both to digest large uh, food molecules, but also to recycle worn out organelles. So at the left-hand side of the screen, you can see a large uh, endocytotic vesicle moving into the cell membrane. And this vesicle will fuse with the lysosome. The lysosome will basically eject its digestive enzymes, uh, digest the molecules within the vesicle, and then they can be uh, used throughout the cell. The other thing that we can do is, again, recycle worn-out organelles. So on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a lysosome that appears to be ingesting what might be a mitochondrium. Now, as we're going to find out, mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell and are going to be responsible for generating ATP, but they do occasionally burn out. And so it's the lysosome's job to basically break this mitochondrion down and recycle its proteins and the other cellular components. Now, similar to the lysosomes, we have the peroxisomes. So peroxisomes are similar in structure to lysosomes, but they tend to be much smaller. Just like lysosomes, they contain very powerful enzymes, but in this case, the enzymes are used to detoxify various types of organic compounds. For example, the toxins of alcohol and formaldehyde can both be detoxified by the catalase enzyme found within the peroxisomes. Another toxin that's generated within the cell as part of its normal metabolism, it's H2O2. 
basically hydrogen peroxide. Now hydrogen peroxide is the stuff that you put on cuts, you see it bubbling up, um, but it's definitely something we don't want to have a lot of inside of cells because it can be very deleterious to protein functioning. And so we want to get rid of as much of this hydrogen peroxide as quickly as possible. And that's what the catalase enzyme does. It basically decomposes hydrogen peroxide into good old water plus oxygen. And that's really the reason that your skin bubbles if you have a cut and you put hydrogen peroxide on it. The hydrogen peroxide is exposed to the catalase enzyme and that catalase enzyme decomposes it into water and also oxygen gas which you see bubbling up from the cut. Now because the catalase or peroxidase enzyme has this special ability to decompose hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, we can basically use it as a presumptive test for human tissue and human blood in crime scenes. And so you've probably seen this test on the CSI detective shows. At the left you see a picture of the Castle Myers test and this is a presumptive test for blood. Basically, if you find something at a crime scene, it's red looking, it could be blood, but you're not sure, you just simply run a swab over that, treat it with some hydrogen peroxide and some phenothaline, and if that fluoresces, that indicates that the catalase or peroxidase enzyme is present, and that that stain may be human blood, or at least some type of animal blood. Now another forensic test that uses the same sort of chemistry is the, called the luminol test. Uh, the luminol test basically you spray a combination of hydrogen peroxide and this special uh, luminol uh, substance uh, onto an area you suspect uh, might have been contaminated with blood and it will fluoresce bright blue for about 30 to 60 seconds. And again this is because of the presence of that catalase enzyme. We also see the same type of activity with hemoglobin. Any surface that's had a significant amount of hemoglobin on it, even if it's been cleaned up, will continue to fluoresce uh, after it's been sprayed with a luminol spray. So if we get a chance in lab this semester, I'll get out some luminol or at least a Castle Myers test and let you all try this out. And remember, this all goes back to the production of catalase or peroxidase by the peroxisomes. Okay, our next organelle is the mitochondrion. Uh, mitochondria is plural and mitochondrion is singular. So the mitochondria are basically the sites of ATP production in the cell and they do this by catabolizing large molecules into smaller molecules and in the process they produce the ATP molecule. Remember ATP is basically the energy currency used within the cell. Okay, so it's fair to say that the mitochondria are basically the powerhouses of the cell. They're the ones that are generating the energy for the cell to do work. Now the interesting things about mitochondria is they actually self-replicate and they actually have their own DNA. And as it turns out, this DNA is actually inherited just from your mother, not from your father. And so we can use mitochondrial DNA to look at how people are related and how different populations are related as well. Now we'll talk a lot more about the mitochondria next semester, but for right now the big picture is that it's a double membrane organelle and that its job is to convert food energy into an energy that can be used by the cell, and that is ATP. Okay, another thing that we have to go over is something called the cytoskeleton. Remember that cyto means cell, and here skeleton we're talking about something that gives the cell structure. So cells come in various shapes and sizes, and the way that they're able to maintain their particular shapes is due to cytoskeleton elements. And these include things like microtubules and microfilaments. They're basically the internal scaffolding within a cell that allows it to have its special three-dimensional structure. Another thing that these cytoskeleton elements do is that they basically form little bitty monorails over which vesicles can travel throughout the cell. You know, up to this point we've been showing vesicles that just move from one organelle to another and somehow get to the right place. But in truth, many of these organelles are traveling along these invisible protein strands within the cell called microtubules or microfilaments. Now an important concept to realize about the cytoskeleton is that it's continuously reorganized based on the present function of the cells. In addition to forming the basis for the internal scaffolding within the cells, the microtubules and microfilaments can also be organized into structures that extend away from the cell membrane. And these include two things called cilia and flagella. Now cilia are very numerous short hair-like projections which extend from the surface of the cell and basically function to move materials across the surface of the cell. On the other hand, flagella, or flagellum is singular, are similar to cilia, but they tend to be much longer, and usually cells just have one or two of them. 
the only example of a flagellum in the human body would be on a sperm cell and most sperm cells at least uh, normal sperm cells only have one flagellum and the purpose of this flagellum is actually to propel the cell forward so at the top left side of the screen you can see an example of a ciliated epithelium we'll talk about epithelia in the next chapter but basically these are the tissues that we find lining the surfaces of the body but also lining internal cavities and so this epithelium we see here is going to be something we find lining the respiratory tract so the trachea and it has these special cells that secrete mucus whereas other cells have a ciliated epithelium above them because the mucus is there to trap solute particles and things like that but remember that mucus has a limited lifetime and so the cilia on the top of the cells are basically going to be beating very very quickly and moving that mucus up towards the pharynx where it can eventually be coughed out or swallowed on the other hand remember that flagella are usually going to be a singular appendage of a cell and they're there to move the cell forward so the one example we have of a flagellum would be on a human sperm cell. They tend to have a very long flagellum and obviously the purpose of this flagellum is to propel them from the vagina where the sperm are ejaculated all the way up through the female's reproductive tract and into the fallopian tubes which is the site of fertilization. So big picture here is that cilia move substances across the surface of cells and flagella move the cells themselves. Okay, so that was an overview of the major organelles found within the cell. Now we're going to move outside and talk about the cell membrane. Now the cell membrane is also called the plasma membrane, and it's a very important structure in the cell because what it does is regulate the passage of substances into and out of the cell. Now there's lots of molecules that make up the plasma membrane, but the three most important molecules are the phospholipids, cholesterol, and proteins. Now you should remember back to the last chapter when we said that the phospholipids were in fact the most numerous component of the cell membranes. And phospholipids are unique among lipids in that they only have two fatty acid tails and that they have a hydrophilic head. Remember we said that most lipids were uniformly hydrophobic. They don't like water and this is why oil and water don't mix. But on the other hand, the phospholipids have a phosphate ion in the head, and this makes the head hydrophilic, that is, it likes water. On the other hand, the two fatty acid tails remain hydrophobic, and so they do not like water. So take a look at that phospholipid down at the bottom right. You know, what would happen if I threw this phospholipid into a beaker of water? Well, it would probably stick its head down into the water and stick its tails out of the water, because the tails are hydrophobic, whereas the head is hydrophilic. So as it turns out, the phospholipids of the cell membrane are organized into something called a bilayer. That means that we have two layers of phospholipids on top of one another. And remember that the heads are hydrophilic and tails are hydrophobic. So hydrophilic is going to like water. So where do we have water? Well, we have water outside the cell. That's called extracellular fluid and we certainly have a lot of water inside the cell as the intracellular fluid or cytosol and so basically the heads orient towards the outside and towards the inside and the tails of the two layers of phospholipids interdigitate with one another and try to exclude as much water as possible so in essence you can imagine that the phospholipid bilayer is sort of like an oreo cookie the two dark outsides are hydrophilic they like water but the inside is hydrophobic it doesn't like water now because the plasma membrane has these unique properties it makes it semi-permeable and that basically means it will let some things through but not others and we'll talk more about the permeability of the membrane in just a few slides so other components of the plasma membrane include proteins and cholesterol now cholesterol if you remember back was a lipid molecule basically created by four interconnected carbon rings and the purpose of cholesterol here is to increase the rigidity of the plasma membrane. Without the cholesterol molecules, the plasma membrane would be very bouncy and fluid-like. In essence, it would be kind of like uh, a waterbed. If you've ever had a chance to sit on a waterbed, you know that if you sit down and somebody else is on the other side, it can just basically knock them right off. And so these cholesterol molecules basically increase the rigidity of the membrane and make it a little bit more solid. The other thing that we find in the plasma membrane are lots of proteins. Proteins are found both going all the way through the membrane, here they're called integral proteins, and some of them are found on the outside of the membrane as well. 
So proteins have lots of different functions in the cell membrane. Some of them act as tunnels through which molecules can move into and out of the cell. Others can act as antigens or sites for cellular recognition, and still others can act as membrane-bound enzymes. And remember that enzymes are proteins that help to speed up a chemical reaction. Now there are two different types of membrane proteins. Integral proteins are proteins which completely or almost completely go from one side of the membrane to the other. And many of these integral proteins are important for basically serving as passageways for certain types of molecules to move into and out of the cell. Another type of protein we have is called peripheral proteins. Peripheral proteins are basically just located on one side of the membrane or the other. That is, they do not breach the distance between the outside and inside the cell. Now, peripheral proteins can have lots of different functions. Again, some are enzymes, and some are joined with carbohydrate molecules to become glycoproteins, and in this case, they can serve for cell-cell recognition. So now that we've learned about the anatomy of the cell membrane, we're going to take a look at its function or physiology. So the cell membrane or plasma membrane is a selectively permeable membrane, and this means that it allows certain substances to pass through, but not others. Now molecules can cross the plasma membrane in three different ways. The first of these is something called passive transport. Now passive transport is a downhill movement of molecules from one side to the other. And this basically requires no energy, but it does require something called a concentration gradient. On the other hand, we can use something called active transport to move molecules against their concentration gradient. However, this will use energy. And the third type, endocytosis, exocytosis, is actually a special type of active transport, which we'll cover in subsequent slides. Now the first transport mechanism we're going to talk about is passive transport. And passive transport, remember, does not require any external energy input, but it does utilize a process called diffusion. And diffusion is the natural tendency of a substance to spread out, moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. For example, take a look at the figure at right, and you can see in the leftmost beaker that I've just placed some food coloring molecules in the beaker of water. Now initially, these food coloring molecules are most abundant or most concentrated at the bottom of the beaker. But look what happens over time. The dye molecules begin to spread out and out until at the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that the food coloring molecules are equally distributed throughout the beaker of water. And this is a characteristic of diffusion in that it eventually leads to a uniform concentration of the solute in the solution. Now, the solution could be water or the solution could even be air. So think about uh, somebody that walks into a classroom and all of a sudden decides that they want to apply some perfume or some cologne. Now, initially, the people around that person are going to become aware of that cologne or perfume, but over the next 30 minutes or so, that perfume is going to spread out throughout the classroom until it becomes uniformly distributed. That is, everybody in the room can smell the perfume. So in a nutshell, diffusion is the movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, and it doesn't require any external energy input. Now one question you might be asking is, what exactly is moving these solute or dye molecules around? Well, it happens to be the kinetic energy of the solution. In this case, the solution here that you see in the figure is water. And water is a liquid, and liquids have molecules that are moving around. And so as those molecules move around, they're going to inadvertently bump into some of those dye molecules and move those around too. Now the same thing also happens in a gas. Again, think of that classroom and the person wearing the perfume. What's moving those perfume molecules around? Well, it's the oxygen and the nitrogen and the other gases in the air. As those gas molecules move around, they inadvertently bump around those perfume molecules as well until they're equally distributed throughout the classroom. So there are several factors that can affect the rate at which diffusion happens. And these are very important because we're going to talk about them in lab as well as in lecture. So these include things like the steepness of the concentration gradient. If we have a lot of something on one side of a membrane and very little or none on the other, the diffusion rate is going to go very, very fast. On the other hand, if we have something that's almost equally distributed throughout the room or across a membrane, the diffusion is going to go very, very slow. Temperature is another factor that affects diffusion rate. In general, the warmer a solution, the more quickly the molecules in that solution will be moving, and so the more quickly they will distribute the solute molecules. And one application for this is if you've ever tried to dissolve, let's say, sugar into water. 
you can take a couple of tablespoons of sugar and put them into a cup of water and chances are it'll take a long time to dissolve. If you want to speed this up, all you have to do is warm up the water and that will increase the movement of the molecules in the water and increase the rate of diffusion. So basically, the higher the temperature, the quicker diffusion happens. Another thing that affects diffusion rate is the size or mass of a diffusing substance. In general, small molecules move more quickly than larger molecules. And so if we have a small dye molecule, it can move more quickly through water than a large dye molecule. And we'll in fact be taking a look at this in lab later on this week. The other thing is surface area affects diffusion rate. The more surface area we have in a cell, the quicker things can cross that cell membrane. And finally, diffusion distance is inversely related to the diffusion rate. Basically, the further a substance has to diffuse, the longer it's going to take. Whereas if you have something that's only moving a short distance, it can diffuse very, very quickly. So in the past few slides, I've used some vocabulary words which you may or may not be familiar with. So in case you're not, we're going to go through these now. So basically a solute is any substance that is dissolved in a solution. For example, the dye molecules we showed two slides back was a good example of a solute. On the other hand, a solvent is a substance in which a solute is dissolved. And in most cases, we're going to be talking about water as a solvent because it's the major solvent inside of living organisms. A concentration gradient basically just means that we have more of a substance on one side of a container or one side of a membrane than another. And remember, having a concentration gradient was a prerequisite to have any type of net diffusion. And finally, a selectively permeable membrane is a membrane like the cell membrane that allows some molecules to cross, but not others. So let's take a look at an example of diffusion of solute molecules across the cell membrane. Now, how quickly a solute molecule will move across the cell membrane depends on a lot of factors. For one, the membrane has to be permeable to the solute. The other thing is we have to have a concentration gradient. And the concentration gradient just basically meant we had more of a solute on one side of the membrane than we did the other. And the steeper the difference between the two sides of the membrane, the more quickly uh, diffusion will occur. And so if the membrane is permeable to the solute, basically the solute molecules will move across that membrane going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until eventually we reach equilibrium. Now at equilibrium there are equal concentrations of the solute on both sides of the membrane. Now this doesn't mean that molecular motion stops, but it simply means that every time a doll but it simply means that every time a dye molecule moves from the left side of the screen, another one moves from the right side of the screen. So at that point we say that we're at equilibrium. We're now going to take a closer look at the process of diffusion by observing the diffusion of sugar molecules throughout a water solution in a U-shaped tube. So here we have our U-shaped glass tube and imagine that it's filled with water. So water is going to be our solvent and sugar molecules will be our solute. So we're going to start out by dropping four sugar molecules into the left hand side of the tube and 12 sugar molecules into the right hand side of the tube. So the question now is what's going to happen? Well remember back to the principles of diffusion. Basically diffusion is the movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So the sugar was initially more concentrated on the right side of the tube than it was on the left side of the tube. And what this means is that the sugar will diffuse from the right side where it's more concentrated to the left side where it's less concentrated. And this net diffusion will occur until we reach equilibrium. That is the point in which the sugar is equally distributed throughout all parts of the tube. Now remember, once this equilibrium occurs, that doesn't mean that the molecules stop moving, but only that they move equally in opposite directions. So now that we've talked about simple diffusion, we're going to go on to talk about a special case of diffusion called osmosis. Osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And in most cases, the membrane we're talking about is the cell membrane. Now, just like any other substance, a water diffuses by going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That is, it likes to go from an area where there's a lot of water to an area where there's less water. However, However, the diffusion of water is also affected by solutes. So it tends to go towards an area where there's more solute because that's an area that has less water. 
So in essence, the net diffusion of water will always be to an area of higher solute concentration. Now, if you're like most people, you're probably having a hard time wrapping your mind around this osmosis versus diffusion thing. If so, all you need to remember is one thing. Solutes suck. And that doesn't mean that solutes are drag or they're bad, but what it does mean is that solutes, like salt, tend to pull water towards them. Said in another way, water tends to move towards an area of greater solute concentration. So if you take a look at the picture at the top of the screen, you can see the salt shakers chasing the slug. Well, many of you know, and probably some of you have even tried this, if you put salt on a slug, which I don't recommend or condone, it will kill the slug by drying it out. That is, the salt on the slug's back will literally pull the water out of the slug's body, causing it to die of desiccation or drying out. And so this is a concept that we're going to see several times throughout this chapter and next, that water always moves to an area of greater solute concentration. So to better illustrate the process of osmosis, we're going to go back to our U-shaped tube full of water. Now the only difference here is that we've now divided the left and right hand sides of the tube with a selectively permeable membrane. This membrane is permeable to water, but is not permeable to sugar. So it will let water across, but it will not let sugar across. Now just like in our last example, we're going to put four sugar molecules on the left hand side of the tube and 12 sugar molecules on the right hand side of the tube. And the question again is what will happen? Well we can start out in saying that if the membrane was permeable to glucose, the glucose would simply diffuse from right to left, just like we saw a couple slides ago. But remember now that the membrane will not let glucose across, but it will let water across. So what will happen? Now because the solute molecules themselves can't move, water will be sucked towards the area of greater solute concentration. That is, water goes down its own concentration gradient from an area where it had a lot of water to an area where there was less water. That is, it went towards an area where there was more solutes. Again, if you can't keep this all straight in your head, just remember solutes suck. And there was more solute on the right hand side of the tube, and so that's the direction that water's going to go. Now we use the term tonicity to talk about the concentrations of solutes both inside and outside of the cell. For example, an isotonic solution would be a solution that has an equal solute concentration to the inside of the cell. And so if you take a look here, you can see that we have the exact same ratio of solutes to water both inside and outside the cell. And remember here that the membrane is probably impermeable to our salts or solutes, and so water is going to be doing the moving back and forth. And water is moving, but the point here is that there's no net diffusion of water. Because the solute is equally distributed on both sides of the membrane, water moves from left to right at the same speed at which it moves from right to left. And so we can say that we are at equilibrium. On the other hand, a hypertonic solution would have a greater solute concentration than the inside of a cell. So here you can see we have a lot more solute outside the cell than we do inside the cell. Again, assuming that this membrane is relatively impermeable to our solutes, but permeable to water, what do you think is going to happen? Well, remember that solutes suck. That is, water is always going to be sucked to an area where there's more solutes. And because there's more solutes outside the cell, the water is going to be drawn across the cell membrane from inside the cell to the outside of the cell. On the other hand, a hypotonic solution would be a solution that has less solutes than what's inside the cell. And so think about which way water is going to go here. There's more solute inside the cell, so that's the way that water is going to go. Cells placed in a hypotonic solution will actually suck up or gain water because there's more solute inside the cell than there is outside the cell. So here's a figure from an older edition of the textbook which shows what happens to cells placed in the three different types of solutions. Now take a look at the left hand side. You can see that we have a human red blood cell. We placed it in an isotonic solution. The arrows there indicate the movement of water. And because you can see that the arrows are the same size, this indicates that water movement in is the same as water movement out. And this is what we'd expect because an isotonic solution would have the same solute concentration that we would find inside of a cell. That doesn't mean that water stops moving, but that water moves into the cell at the same rate that it moves out of the cell. As a result, the size and shape of the red blood cell would be the same. It's normally going to look like a Cheerio. Now let's take a look at the middle picture we put a blood cell in a hypotonic solution. 
Remember that hypo means it has a lower solute concentration than what's inside the cell. So more solute inside the cell is going to cause water to be sucked into the cell. And that water being sucked into the cell is going to create more water movement in and less water movement out. And as a result, that red blood cell is going to swell and become bigger until at some point it's actually going to rupture. And finally, take a look at the right-hand figure. We've placed the same red blood cell in a hypertonic solution. Remember that hyper means a greater solute concentration, so there will be more solute outside the cell than there is inside the cell. And what do solutes do? That's right, they suck. The highly concentrated solution outside the cell is going to suck the water from inside the cell to the outside in the solution. As a result, that cell is going to shrink or crenate because it's been placed in a hypertonic solution. And that's why the arrow out of the cell is much longer than the arrow into the cell because the net movement of fluid is out of the cell into the solution. So now that we have a basic understanding of the processes of osmosis and diffusion, we're going to go back to our friend passive transport. Now remember, passive transport utilizes diffusion to move things across the cell membrane. And diffusion does require a concentration gradient, but it does not require the expenditure of any ATP. That is, as long as we have a concentration gradient in our favor, it's going to happen for free. And there are three ways in which passive transport can move substances into or out of the cell. We can go through the phospholipid bilayer, we can go through protein channels, or we can utilize something called facilitated diffusion. So let's take a look at the first method, which is diffusion across the phospholipid bilayer. Now remember, the phospholipid bilayer makes up the bulk of the cell membrane, and that the tails of the phospholipids are very hydrophobic, and they tend to be more towards the middle of the bilayer. And so what this means is that polar molecules like water, or charged molecules, let's say like potassium, can't travel very easily through this bilayer. So what can get through are very small molecules like oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas, and also other lipids. Because remember, like dissolves like. And so cholesterol or triglycerides may be able to move fairly easily throughout the plasma membrane because they're also made of the same stuff. Now in the last slide we said that the lipid bilayer was permeable to very small nonpolar molecules, was not very permeable to water, and also very not permeable to ions, that is things with a charge. So how do we get things that have a charge or are polar across the cell membrane? And the answer here are protein channels. We have special transmembrane proteins which allow ionic substances and water into and out of the cell. In general, most of these proteins tend to be molecule specific. That is, if they let sodium through, they're not going to let calcium through. So examples of things that use protein channels are all ions and, of course, water. Another type of diffusion that utilizes transmembrane proteins is something called facilitated diffusion. Facilitated diffusion is very similar to the diffusion through the protein channels, but the only difference is, is that the protein undergoes a conformational change as the solute moves from one side of the membrane to the other. And so an example of this is the movement of glucose into the cell. So take a look at the left-hand side of the screen. At number one, you can see that glucose is binding to the transport protein. Number two, that protein changes shape. And number three, it spits the glucose out on the other side. Now, just like other forms of passive transport, we need to have a favorable concentration gradient. That is, in order for this to work, there needs to be more glucose on the outside of the cell than there is inside of the cell. Okay, now that we've talked about the three ways in which passive transport can be used to move things across the cell membrane, we're going to go to talk about active transport. And active transport differs from passive transport in that it specifically can push things against their concentration gradient, and it also needs a source of energy. And you might ask yourself, why would we ever spend energy or ATP on moving something across the cell membrane if it could happen for free with diffusion? Well, let's think about this. Remember with diffusion, what's the greatest concentration you can get inside the cell? Well, that's the same concentration as it is outside the cell. So looking at it a different way, imagine that you have eight apples, and that you want to get those apples from outside of the cell to inside the cell. By using diffusion, the greatest number of apples you could get inside the cell would be four, because once we had four outside the cell and four inside the cell, we would basically be at equilibrium. But let's say I really like apples, or let's say another molecule that's important to the cell, and I want to bring them all inside the cell. 
In that case, I can use active transport to literally pull things from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. But in order to do this, I will need some kind of energy, mostly ATP. So one example of active transport is something called the sodium potassium pump. The sodium potassium pump is literally a membrane protein that pushes all the sodium from inside the cell to the outside of the cell and takes all the potassium from outside the cell and puts it inside the cell. And not only does this move things against their concentration gradient, but it also moves them against their electrical gradient. And the sodium potassium pump is really important for cellular metabolism, but also for generating a difference in charge across the cell membrane. And this is especially used by neurons or nerve cells that use this difference in charge to communicate between different areas of the body. So we'll talk more about the sodium potassium pump later on, but just realize that any time you see the word pump, we're talking about something that's utilizing energy, whether direct or indirect, to move a substance against its concentration gradient. Another type of membrane transport which uses energy and so would be called active transport is known as endocytosis and exocytosis. Now this is a type of transport used to transport very large molecules across the cell membrane. Now these would be molecules which couldn't diffuse through the bilayer and also couldn't fit through those special protein tunnels. So we tend to use it for very large, let's say carbohydrate molecules or protein molecules that move into or out of the cell and both of these methods involve the formation of vesicles. So exocytosis would be the movement of a vesicle from inside a cell to an area outside the cell. For example, if we're making a protein in our rough endoplasmic reticulum and we want to extrude it from the cell, we'll do that through the process of exocytosis. On the other hand, endocytosis is a process where we take large molecules and bring them into the cell and you can see that we first start with an invagination or a dimple in the cell membrane and that dimple closes off until we have a membrane bound vesicle of our molecules and we bring them into the cell. And of course after that if it's a food molecule or a foreign molecule we're probably going to take that vesicle and join it with one of our lysosomes. So endocytosis and exocytosis are used for the movement of large molecules and yes they do use energy. We're going to wrap up today's lecture by talking about the process of cell division. And cell division is basically the process by which cells reproduce themselves. And it consists of two parts. The first part is nuclear division, which involves either mitosis or meiosis. And the second part is the division of the cytoplasm, which is called cytokinesis. The first type of cell division or nuclear division is called mitosis. And mitosis results in the production of diploid daughter cells, which are genetically identical to the parent cell. And this is a type of cell division that occurs in most body cells. An example would be if you cut yourself and that cut eventually heals up through the process of mitotic cell division. And each one of those cells that was created from the dividing cell would have the same number of chromosomes, the exact same genes, it would be genetically identical to the parent cells. The second type of cell division is called meiosis, and meiosis is a type of cell division which occurs exclusively within the gonads, that is the ovaries and testes, and it results in the production of haploid gametes, and haploid just basically means they have half the number of genes that the parent cell did. The other thing is that the gametes, or the daughter cells, are not genetically similar to the parent cells. That is, they are genetically quite different due to recombination and a variety of factors which we'll talk about uh, next semester when we hit the reproductive system. Now, for this semester, the one type of cell division you do need to know about is mitosis, and that's what we're going to be talking about in the subsequent slides. So mitosis is a type of nuclear division that happens in somatic cells. And by somatic cells, we mean all body cells with the exclusion of some cells in the ovaries and some cells in the testes. So what does a cell do for most of its life? Well, the cell cycle can be divided into two large categories. The first category is called interphase, and the second category is called mitosis. Now mitosis is the process where we get ready to divide the nucleus so we can divide that cell from one into two and mitosis is a very short part of the cell's life cycle. Most of the cell's life cycle is spent in interphase, which is in between. And we'll talk about the different parts of interphase in here in a couple slides. Now before we go on to talk more about mitotic nuclear division, we need to go back and review why the nucleus was important. 
Well, the nucleus was important because it contained all the DNA molecules. And remember, the DNA molecules are the blueprint to generate new cells and also to direct the manufacture of protein. So the nucleus of each somatic cell has 46 DNA molecules. And these DNA molecules are wrapped around proteins to become something called chromosomes. Now these chromosomes are 46 or 23 pairs. And the two chromosomes that make up a pair are called a homologous pair. And the reason we call them the homologous pair is because one of those copies comes from our mother and the other copy comes from our father. And so we said before that the combined DNA molecules in our cell is like a giant cookbook. And so you can imagine that each one of these chromosomes is like a chapter in the cookbook. But instead of just having one copy of each chapter, we actually have two, and this is our homologous pairs. Now it's important to realize that the chapter that we get from mom and the chapter that we get from dad are not exactly the same. They code for the same types of proteins or the same structures within the body, but they may not have exactly the same recipe, so they're not genetically the same. Now a cell that has all 46 chromosomes or two copies of each chromosome is said to be diploid or 2N. And again, the number two comes for the fact that we have one copy from mom, one copy from dad, so two copies of each chromosome altogether. A cell that only has one copy of each chromosome would be said to be haploid. And the only examples of haploid cells that we'll talk about this year will be the sperm and the egg. They only have one copy of each chromosome. So let's go back to look at the cell cycle. Remember that I said before that the cell cycle basically spends a lot of time not reproducing and a short time reproducing. So you can think of it as being a teenage boy. They would like to be out there reproducing a whole lot more, but in general they spend a lot of their life doing other things. And so the in-between time when a cell is not dividing, it's actually in something called interphase. So interphase has three different subphases, G1, S, and G2. Now the G1 phase involves the growth of the cytoplasm and replication of organelles. And this happens immediately after the cell has gone through mitosis once. So once a cell undergoes mitosis once, it produces two cells, but these cells tend to be smaller than the parent cell. Essentially it's like taking a piece of bread dough and dividing it into two parts. Even though we've gone from one to two, the two parts are smaller than the parent. And so we need to grow those cells before they begin to divide again. The other thing that happens during the G1 phase is the replication of organelles. Remember, if we've just divided, we've probably reduced the number of organelles in each cell by half. And so it's important that we restock our supply of organelles by replicating them as well. The next phase of interphase is something called the S phase. And think of S as meaning synthesis. This is when we replicate our DNA molecules or our chromosomes. If you think about cell division and the fact that we want both of our daughter cells to have the exact same genetic information, we want to essentially photocopy our DNA so each cell will have the same information. So that's exactly what happens during the S phase. And finally, the G2 phase is a phase of continued cytoplasmic growth and also the production of enzymes and other molecules which will be necessary for mitotic cell division. So let's take a look at what happens during the S phase or synthesis phase of interphase. Again, this is the time when we're synthesizing copies of our DNA molecules so that each of the future daughter cells will have all the genetic information it needs. Basically what happens is the DNA molecule, which is an alpha helix, unzips and then mirror copies are formed by synthesizing nucleotides that are complementary to the existing nucleotides on the single strand. Remember that A always pairs with C and T always pairs with G. And so if we know the code on one side of the strand, we also know what code should be laid down on the opposite side of the strand as well. And this process results in the production of two completely identical DNA molecules. So in addition to being able to tell me what goes on during interphase, you should be able to recognize what a cell would look like if it were in interphase. And in fact, most of the cells that you're going to see in lab are in interphase because it is the longest time of a cell's life cycle. So during interphase, we see a cell during the microscope and we can see a very distinct nucleus that is distinct from cytoplasm. And we may see a bunch of fuzz inside the nucleus, but we don't see distinct chromosomes. And that's because the chromosomes are unwound in the nucleus during interphase. The DNA has been unwound from the histones and that's because the DNA is actively being read and transcribed throughout the cell. 
So basically, if you see a cell that looks like something on the left-hand side of the screen, you know that it's in interphase because we have a distinct nucleus and we don't see any chromosomes inside that nucleus. Okay, and so that was interphase. Interphase is one of two major parts of the cell's life cycle. In fact, it's the major part of the cell's life cycle. Everything else that happens is during the mitotic phase. And the mitotic phase has several subphases that we're going to learn about, including prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And remember, mitosis is specifically the division of the nucleus into two nuclei of the future daughter cells. And in many textbooks, we also lump in cytokinesis along with that as well. That is, the cell is actually dividing the cytoplasm as well. But your textbook now looks at these as being two distinct events that are happening at the same time. So the first subphase of mitosis is called prophase. Remember, pro means before or sort of getting ready. And so prophase is getting us ready for nuclear division. And what happens here is the chromatin, the DNA inside the nucleus, condenses into visible structures, which are called chromosomes. Remember, that's just DNA wrapped around a protein. The other thing that will happen is the nucleolus and nuclear envelope will begin to disappear. And by the end of prophase, they are completely gone. And this is because we're going to have some unique structures reaching in to grab a hold of these chromosomes and sort them out. And so we can't have a nuclear membrane getting in the way. The other thing that's happening is we have centrosomes are moving to the opposite side of the cell, forming something called the mitotic spindle. Now the mitotic spindle, you can see those yellow little thread-like things. These are special microtubules that will reach into the dissolving nucleus and grab a hold of the chromosomes to arrange them in a specific order. The next phase of mitosis is called metaphase. And I want you to remember meta is meaning middle in this case. Because during metaphase, the chromosomes have been pulled to the center of the cell and lined up along something called the equatorial line. And this is because our microtubules have grabbed a hold of the centromeres, or central region, holding the left and right chromatids together. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see what this looks like as far as a conceptual view. And on the right-hand side of the screen, this is an actual cell that's in metaphase. All the chromosomes are organized in a single line going down the metaphase plate of the cell. The next phase is anaphase. Anaphase is characterized by the splitting and separation of the centromeres and the movement of the two sister chromatids of each pair towards opposite parts of the cell. Now remember we said earlier that the sister chromatids are in fact genetically identical to one another. Remember what happened during the S phase of interphase. That was the point where we were synthesizing duplicates of our DNA molecule so that one cell could have one copy and the other cell could have the other copy. And so the sister chromatids are exact genetic duplicates of one another. And so one chromatid moves towards one cell, and the other chromatid moves towards the opposite pole of the other cell. Now remember that the movement of these sister chromatids towards opposite poles of the cell was due to the movement or shortening of our microtubules of our mitotic spindle. Basically, we were playing a tug-of-war with our chromosomes, and at some point we tugged so hard that the sister chromatids were pulled apart. Remember, the sister chromatids are genetically identical to one another. That is, the blue one on the left side is genetically identical to the blue one on the right side, and the red one on the left side is genetically identical to the red one on the left side. Now, once we pull these chromatids apart, we do in fact call them daughter chromosomes because they each contain the same genetic information. Now these chromosomes will appear a little bit V-shaped as they are dragged towards the poles of the cell. And this is one way that you can recognize and distinguish anaphase from, let's say, telophase or metaphase. And finally, the last stage of mitosis is called telophase. Now telophase begins as soon as the movement of chromatids stops. And at this point, the identical sets of chromosomes uncoil and revert back into chromatin. Remember, chromatin was the unwound DNA that is normally characteristic of interphase in a cell. We also have disappearance of our microtubules and our mitotic spindle. We've just divided our nucleus, so we don't need that anymore. And finally, we have a new nuclear membrane or envelope forming. And so the cell goes back to looking much like it normally does during interphase. And by the end of telophase, we will have new nucleoli within each of these nuclei.
Now another process that begins to happen simultaneously in late anaphase and telophase is that we begin to have cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is just the division of the cytoplasm and although your book sort of sets it aside as a stage outside of mitosis, it's important for you to realize that it's really happening at the same time as both anaphase and telophase. So in the picture below you can see something called a cleavage furrow forming. Now cleavage is just a process of dividing what was one cell into two cells. And so we have a ring of contractile microtubules which are basically pinching off that cytoplasm into two cells. And so the result of cytokinesis is that we end up with two daughter cells that are probably half the size of the parent cell. And that's because we've taken a large cytoplasmic cell and divided it into two smaller cells. And so it's important to remember that cytokinesis is going on at the same time as late anaphase and all throughout telophase. Now once the cell has completed cytokinesis, it will then re-enter interphase. Remember that the majority of a cell's life is in fact made up of interphase. And interphase is everything that the cell is doing when it's not reproducing. So the cell is growing, it's doing what cells do. Now one thing we're not going to get a chance to talk about in this lecture is cancer. As you're probably aware is that cancer is a special type of uncontrolled cell division. Now normally when cells divide they have a way of knowing when they should divide and when they should stop dividing. Normally if you put cells in a petri dish they will divide, divide, divide until they hit the edges of that dish and then they'll stop dividing. But sometimes cells are mutated in a way either because they have defective genes to begin with or because of chemical or radiation factors that somehow alter the DNA and disrupt the mechanisms which regulate cell division. As a result, we can end up with cells that just divide and divide and divide, and that's what we call cancer. So we're going to talk more about cancer in future chapters, but it is important to realize that some of the drugs that we now use to treat cancers act specifically on the mitotic spindle. That is, they inhibit the mitotic spindle from forming. And if the mitotic spindle cannot form, we cannot divide our nucleus and the cell cannot divide. And so we can stop the cancer just by disrupting the process of mitosis. Okay, you've reached the end of the lecture on the cell and also on membrane transport. I've included a couple links below if you want to get a little bit more information on the process of mitosis. A couple of these go to really nice animated websites that show the process of mitosis in a step-by-step -step fashion. So I strongly suggest that you visit these because I really think they'll be a big help on your upcoming exam. As with every chapter, there's going to be a brief set of questions after this lecture just to test your comprehension on the topics discussed in lecture. Just like normal, you're not going to receive a grade for these questions, but if you do score less than 70%, I suggest you go back and review the lecture and take detailed notes.